Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are tuning into from the world. And welcome to our grand season finale to our online coaching series here with California Water Sport Collective. My name is Melissa DeMarie, and I have been the host of the series and the host of the show today. We have just had a phenomenal last few months while we have all been locked down in quarantine and dealing with all sorts of fun issues surrounding the, uh, the, the nasty C word COVID. But um, anyways, sometimes some really great things come about uh, with adversity. And through this, we have come up with this really great online series. We have, we have offered live webinars for the last couple of months. We've offered them three days a week from all over the world, from Norway to the East Coast, to California, to so many places beyond um, and we do have more in the future so stay tuned so today we're really excited we're welcoming darcy back to the show she's already given a couple of webinars that have been absolutely phenomenal um, so we're really super excited about that um, anyways um but i would like to introduce we have a, a for our, our season finale today we have a special co-host with us today today joining us we have hannah musgrove now hannah is a Cali Collective Junior Ambassador, and um, she is fairly well versed with Darcy's book, Amazon Woman, uh, where she really talks about her source to sea expedition of the Amazon River. So Hannah, I am going to pass the mic over to you right now, and then um, we will go from there. All right. Hannah, Hello. are you there? Is it working? You're on, Hannah. Go for it. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so like Melissa said, I'm a Cali Collective Junior Ambassador, and I grew up, I live on the South Fork of the American, so that's where I, I paddle. Um, it was really amazing reading Darcy's book because it, you can really see the feeling behind it because of the mental journey and the physical journey of the Amazon. Um, yeah. Thanks, Hannah. Hannah, do you want to just um, introduce Darcy? And then Darcy, you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Darcy? I don't really know. <laughs> hey, Darcy, are you with us today? Yeah. We wanted to get we wanted to get Hannah on the show, so. Darcy, welcome, welcome back. Thanks so much for being here. And thank you, Hannah, so much for that introduction. Thanks for, uh, Hannah and I just got off a wild and scenic road trip where Hannah had her, uh, had a few first personal first descents on, but she ran every single rapid, her and her younger sister with loaded boats. And uh, we had some, we had some, uh, some good expedition and expedition, expedition planning and, uh, Thanks so much. Anyway, so Darcy, we're gonna we're gonna pass the mic on over to you now. Thanks so much, Hannah. We'll see you in a bit. Sounds awesome. Uh, thanks everyone for being here, and uh, thanks Hannah for the awesome introduction. And I don't know Hannah personally yet, but I do know that she's a badass kayaker, and I can't wait to go kayaking with her. Um, I also want to say a big thanks to Melissa and the California Water Sport Collective. This was an awesome idea that uh, came out of the COVID situation to keep us all sane during a uh, lockdown. So thanks, Melissa, this has been an awesome thing. Um, I'm gonna start my screen share here. I think. And all right. So tonight I'm gonna talk about kayaking the Amazon River, and I'll go through the journey in my slideshow. And at the end of the talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about my motivation for writing the book, Amazon Woman, which, which was to try to encourage people not to let other people's judgments of them direct the course of their life. And hopefully, if you guys can stick around for question and answers, we can uh, have a bit of a conversation about that towards the end. But um, in 2013, I kayaked the Amazon River from source to sea with Don Beveridge and David Midgley. And 
Um, I'm going to start by introducing the river. So the Amazon River is more than 4,000 miles long. That's longer, that's more than a thousand miles longer than the distance between New York City and San Francisco. And there's big debate in the geographic world about whether the Nile or the Amazon is the world's longest river. But everyone agrees that the Amazon is the world's largest river by volume. So the Amazon holds 20% of the Earth's fresh water, and it's bigger than the next six biggest rivers on Earth combined. So stop and think about that for a minute. This is a lot of water that we're talking about. Um, I think that we often have a hard time imagining this because most of us don't have a great frame of reference for this amount of water. But I think um, probably everyone in this group is familiar with the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon. So this is a big river for Western US standards. And this is a photo at low water. So low water in the Grand Canyon is typically about 7,000 cubic feet per second. And for comparison, low water in the Amazon is about 7 million cubic feet per second. So this is the Amazon River. This is not the ocean. So we're talking about a lot of water. And people often want to know like what it was like to kayak a river this big, you know, to start when it was just a few inches wide and end when it looks like this. And it's hard to sum this up into a talk, but I'm going to try to paint a picture of the overall feeling of the trip. So I'm sure that everyone here has had a really long, tiring day, like a day that just left you totally drained, totally exhausted. And maybe you got there from kayaking, you know, a long, hard day of kayaking. Maybe you got there from work or maybe just from life in general, but I'm sure we can all relate to this feeling. So try to conjure up this feeling and then add in about 2 billion bugs, oppressive heat, dehydration, and then throw on top of all that, that one of your two kayaking partners or one of the two people that you spend every waking moment with tells you that uh, he has no emotion, doesn't know any better. So that was David Midgley. He's the guy on the right with the blue boat. Don's on the left and Don was only slightly less annoying. And I'm sure if the boys were giving this talk, they would just tell you how wonderful I was for the entire trip. Uh, the guy on the far left without the kayak, that's Mateo and he owned the land where we started our expedition. So after people hear that, um, a lot of people want to know, like, why would you want to do this to yourself? So why suffer your way across South America? And I don't have a great answer to that question. Um, I'm going to try to answer it by giving an Oprah quote, because, you know, who doesn't love Oprah? And uh, last winter, Oprah was a guest on The Daily Show with Trevor Noah. And obviously, Oprah is seen as a successful person, and she's been in contact with a lot of successful people over the course of her career. So Trevor asked her, he said, Oprah, what is the common characteristic of successful people? And um, I'm going to read you her answer. She said, people get to where they want to go because they know where they want to go. A lot of people are going and being driven by what they think they should do by what other people want them to do, or by what they've carried in their minds for a long time that they should do. But the most important thing you can ever do is ask yourself, what do I really want? And I love this definition of success. I had never heard it put quite this way before. And it's very simple, just figure out what you wanna do. And of course, when you put that into practice, figuring out what you want to do can be very complicated, but once you figure it out, uh, you should be pretty good to go. And I think this is like a really achievable goal for all of us. So I was pretty lucky because from my early twenties, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to go kayaking and I am sure that this is not what Oprah had in mind, but still, this was my thing. This was my passion and my driving force. 
And um, things were going fairly well. You know, I ran a successful kayak guiding business and I had kayaked some of the world's hardest rivers. So on the one hand, uh, things were great. On the other hand though, my passion was seen by many as like not a real passion or not a real, real life trajectory. And especially the older I got, more and more people felt that it was inappropriate. So I was starting to get a lot of questions like, when are you gonna settle down? Uh, when are you gonna stop playing around all the time and get a real job? And didn't I want some security for the future? And so all of this got to me, you know, like kayaking and adventures still had a really strong hold on me. And I really wasn't interested in doing all these things that everyone else wanted me to do. But that made me feel like something was wrong with me. So I kind of came up with this plan where the Amazon, like I knew it would be longer, harder, bigger than any expedition I had ever done. And so I started to look at it as like my final hurrah. So this would be my last big adventure. It would satisfy all my uh, wandering needs. And then I could come home and get a job in an office, make more money, uh, start a 401k. And then I figured that everyone else would stop questioning my life choices. So this was my mindset as I set off to the Amazon River. And now the whole Amazon trip was born out of David Midgley's midlife crisis. So I'm gonna call him Midge from now on. But Midge is a really brilliant computer programmer. He lives in London. And sometime in his early 30s, he started thinking that, or he started worrying that he was gonna waste his life sitting in front of a computer writing code. So he was kind of having the opposite life crisis that I was having. But Midge decided that he would do one big adventure and that would be good for him. So he started uh, scouring the adventure archives and eventually he realized that no one had ever kayaked the Amazon from source to sea. When he was doing his research, five people had descended the river from source to sea but they had all either walked around or rafted through the white water. So no one had kayaked the whole thing. And then he read a statistic that more people had walked on the moon than had descended the Amazon from source to sea. And once he read that, uh, his decision was made. He was sold and committed to this Amazon idea. The only problem was that Midge did not know how to kayak. He had never sat in a kayak, he had never been camping, and he really had never done anything athletic in his life. But he now had this vision of himself standing on a beach at the Atlantic Ocean after having kayaked the Amazon. And everything he did for the next 10 years was revolved around making this dream come true. So he joined his local kayak club in London and trained with them for about three years. And he after that was like a class three kayaker. And that's when he discovered small world adventures. So this is Don and um, Don and I ran, still run small world adventures together. Don is a very good kayaker and a very good coach. And Midge saw on our website that we offered everything from beginner trips up to coaching for class five kayaking. So. Midge came to us with the idea that we could train him to be a class five kayaker so that he could survive the whitewater in the Amazon headwaters. And he trained with us for eight years. He came to Ecuador every winter, sometimes for as short as two weeks, sometimes for as long as two months. And after that, he felt ready. And Don and I agreed with him. He truly had transformed himself into a class five kayaker. And uh, then when it was time to go, Midge invited us to come with him. And so our first challenge was to find the sport of the Amazon. And so from 1950 until 2012, pretty much the whole world agreed that the Aparimac River in Peru was the headwaters of the Amazon or was the longest tributary of the Amazon. But in 2012, Rocky Contos discovered that the Montaro River was actually 47 miles longer. So we switched plans. Um, we had originally planned to descend the Aparimac, but we changed the Montaro River. But even then, we still had to find, we had to trace the Montaro's tributaries upriver to find the longest one and the longest flowing water that we could find. 
So that led us to Lago Acucocha. We paddled our kayaks across the lake and then hiked up this mountainside. And eventually we determined that this was the highest flowing water we could find. And this is Don and Midge standing over the source of the Amazon. So when we set off on this expedition, we all had in our minds, like we knew there would be white water and we knew we'd be starting at high elevation. But what was dominating the mental picture for us was heat, flat water, and bugs. And so we were a little mentally unprepared for the weather at 15,000 feet at the source. And this is us with frozen socks and frozen shoes. And for about the first five nights, our water bottles froze solid and we were a little bit chilly, which was uh, something that we didn't appreciate as much as we should have. The first few days were kind of pleasant paddling through irrigation ditches in the high elevation grasslands. But then we eventually dropped into the mines and there's a lot of mines in the Andes in Peru. This one is a copper mine that we paddled through. And then we got to a lime mine and here the entire river went underground for almost two miles. So we had to portage our kayaks around until the water popped back up again. We also paddled through all these towns that support the mining industry. And it really made us uh, realize how much we take for granted a lot of our clean water protections. And here, like the typical architecture was to have the bathrooms facing the river with a PVC pipe leading straight from the toilet to midair over the river. And there's also not a ton of trash service in these towns. And so a lot of the trash ended up in the rivers and again, it was just a great reminder to support organizations like American Whitewater and others that work hard to protect our rivers. But eventually we got to the Montaro River proper and we got more water and we started to feel a little bit like kayakers again. We started to drop into the canyon lands of the Montaro and then eventually we got to some real whitewater. And for the first 10 days of the trip, we had a support van that could meet up with us almost every night. And so they carried the bulk of our gear and we'd uh, meet up with them to camp. But after 10 days, the Montaro dropped into this little crack in the earth. And uh, we had to say goodbye to our support van and we had to start, start self-supporting. So carrying all of our camping gear, food, passports, satellite phones, all that kind of stuff in the boats with us. And of course, um, this self-supporting pretty much coincided with the start of the class five. So kind of had a double shock to our system, getting into the hard white water and doing it with loaded boats. But whatever we lacked in comfort at this point, we was made up for by awesome camp spots in the Montero Canyons. And so there was about 15 days of class five white water on the Montaro including uh, that we paddled through a construction site for a new dam that they're building and on the Montaro River. And that is a dump truck in the river on the right side of the screen. And the volume was kind of medium. It was about 4,000 CFS. The rapids were really long and continuous and pushy. And I just can't say enough what an amazing job Midge did. You know, he was, uh, pushing his whitewater skills to their absolute limit, but he somehow managed to keep a pretty level head for more than two weeks of, you know, pretty much constant adrenaline rushes for him. And the fact that he was able to kayak this river is really a testament to what you can do when you put your mind to it. So after the whitewater canyons, we had about 25 days total of whitewater. And then we hit the flat water. And so I mentioned, I think we started at 15,000 feet in elevation and we dropped 13,000 feet to where the flat water began. So we were definitely in for a really long flat paddle out. And for those of you that pay attention to river gradients, you know, a good creek is often 80 or 100 feet per mile in gradient, but the, the bulk of the flat water on the Amazon drops about two inches per mile. So we had a lot of flat water. The beginning of the flat water also coincided with Peru's red zone. And this is a notoriously dangerous and violent part of the world, part of Peru, I guess I should say. And what makes it so dangerous is that 
there's a lot of different factors at play. There's the local indigenous group is called the Ashanikas. And for about 200 years, everyone who has come into their territory has either wanted to kill them or wanted to take something from them. And they've basically received no or very little support from the Peruvian military or police. So they've really had to take their safety into their own hands. And um, they had a pretty recent and bad threat. The Shining Path movement was very active in this region. And the Shining Path uh, started out as a Maoist insurgency, but very quickly kind of devolved into a violent terror organization. And this was in the 1980s and the 1990s. And they were very active in the Ashanika's home. And the Ashanika lost about a third of their population during this. Um, more recently, this is now the site of big time cocaine production. In 2013, Peru overtook Colombia as the world's number one cocaine producing country in the world. And there's also a lot of illegal logging here. And so the, you know, all these people wanting to take something from the Ashanika and the Ashanika having to take their own safety into their own hands does make it kind of a scary place to travel through. But we got permission letters from the Ashanika in Lima before we left. And those basically served to just alert them to what we were doing, what, what were our intentions. We were just traveling through, we didn't want to stay, we didn't want to take anything. And I was very fearful of going into this region. So somewhere along the Whitewater, we got to a town and I cut all my hair off because I was thinking that maybe a group of three guys would be seen as less of a target than two guys and a girl. We also had, uh, we were in the red zone for a total of 30 days. And the first two weeks we were on our own. So the last two weeks we had an escort by the Peruvian Navy. So kind of a combination of all these things um, ensured that we were safe. And we actually ended up having great experiences there. The Ashanika, once they saw our permission letters and our passports were extremely welcoming. They always let us camp on their beaches and wanted to know if they could help in any way. And, you know, we'd really just realized that they were great people just trying to protect themselves. So after the red zone, we uh, had some boring times and this was not great for group morale. Cause in the whitewater section, we all had this common goal that we were, you know, trying to get through the whitewater. In the red zone, we had this external threat to our safety. So we were all banding together as a team. And after those two things were over, we didn't have like this common bond. I mean, obviously we still had the common goal of wanting to get to the Atlantic, but I wanted to get there faster than Midge did. And we ended up having some kind of diverging miniature goals, I guess I would say. And this is where the mindset thing really came into play for me. Um, you know, the adventure mindset needs to be really flexible and you need to expect things to go wrong and that you're not going to get your way and that it's going to be hard. And I definitely lost this, especially around day 100 of the expedition. And this just made me be really irritated at dawn, really irritated at midge. And it was kind of not allowing me to enjoy this amazing experience that I was having. And this wasn't easy to do. I definitely suffered for about two weeks of trying to talk myself into it, trying to process it. But eventually I was able to make, you know, a pretty minor tweak in my own attitude. You know, nothing about the external circumstances changed, but I just tweaked my own mental outlook. And then all of a sudden it was so much easier to enjoy where I was. I could, you know, enjoy seeing these pink Amazonian river dolphins that we got to see almost every day. This is a picture I took and here's one from a professional photographer so you can see what they actually look like. And I was able to check out the boat traffic. We had, you know, logging barges, little kids paddling around in boats, super tankers. We passed uh, villages and cities on a pretty regular basis. This is Iquitos, Peru which has half a million residents and it's the largest city in the world that you cannot drive to. So you can only get there by air or by boat. We saw some interesting floating trash and amazing sunsets. And after I changed my own outlook, I was able to see how 
sort of silly it was for me to, you know, be so caught up in whatever I was worried about, you know, getting home to my shower faster or, you know, whatever it was, it was uh, pretty trivial stuff. It was perhaps my biggest lesson on the Amazon River of what a big difference your own attitude makes in any situation in life. So with about one month left to go, um, we got to a part of the river where storms became a really frequent occasion, like pretty much every day. And it was pretty cool. We would hear howler monkeys. And when they would start to cry, we knew that in about five or 10 minutes, we were going to get hit by a big storm. And at this point, it was constantly windy, always an upriver wind, so much so that if we stopped paddling, we would just get blown back upstream. But when the storms would come, it would become even more windy. We'd get tons of rain, lightning, and it would usually cut visibility down to about 10 feet which was kind of nerve wracking because we were sharing the river with pretty big boats at this point. Eventually we passed Manaus and the meeting of the waters and the black water on the right is the Rio Negro. The muddy water on the left side of the screen is the Amazon. And because of a difference in water temperatures and sediment load, these two rivers don't mix. And even 30 miles downstream of the confluence, you can still see a very distinct line. Eventually, we got into the tidal zone and um, tides come up the Amazon River more than 600 miles. And at first we could paddle against them, but eventually they became so strong that we'd have to sit it out when an incoming tide was coming in. The landscape also changed pretty dramatically in the tidal zone where there was no longer much solid ground. So the, it was kind of dominated by mud flats and mangrove swamps. And so everyone built their houses on stilts and the tidal fluctuation was about 15 feet. So they had to be pretty high to accommodate tidal fluctuations. And we were in Brazil at this point and we didn't speak very much Portuguese, but Everyone was always incredibly kind to us and willing to let us sit on their dock for five hours while we waited out the tide. This guy here was making shrimp traps and we were still a long ways from the ocean. So these are freshwater shrimp that they were catching. So eventually we got to within 10 miles of our stopping point. And our stopping point was before we left, we had looked at a map and drawn a line between the north bank and the south bank that jutted out furthest into the ocean. And we picked a little point about two miles offshore and we programmed that waypoint into the GPS when we started the expedition. And so again, we're out here where there wasn't much land to sleep on. So when the tide went out, we slept on this rock and you can see behind us all the mud flats. So it's low tide when this photo was taken. And we had to wake up and wait it out about five hours till the tide started going out again. And eventually we started paddling. And even though it was only um, six miles, no, 10 miles, sorry. Even though it was only 10 miles, it took us six hours to complete because the waves were huge, the wind was strong. But eventually we left <clears throat> the muddy water of the Amazon and we hit the blue water of the Atlantic and we paddled past our little waypoint marker on the GPS. And it was kind of a strange feeling, sort of unceremonious because the ocean conditions were too rough that we didn't feel like we could hang out there and even high five or anything. So after 148 days of struggling to this end point, we kind of said, oh, we made it. All right, let's paddle to shore. Two mile paddle into shore. But once we got there, we were able to really celebrate. We had a white sand beach all to ourselves an amazing sunset, perfect ending for this journey. And in total, we kayaked 4,300 miles. It took us 148 days. We estimate that we took over 2 million paddle strokes. We became the first group to do the entire Amazon in kayaks. Midge became the first British person to kayak the Amazon. I became the first woman and the first vegan to do it. And Don became the first guy to kayak the Amazon because his girlfriend made him. And I'm almost done, but I just want to do a quick, bring this back again to my motivation for writing the book is that 
we were kind of an unlikely team to do this. You know, Midge was very unathletic, total computer geek, and he trained for 10 years and then just to imagine the dedication that took. And he did things like he took up running marathons for fitness. He found kayaking extremely scary when he started the sport. And so he took up skydiving because he was afraid of heights and he knew that he would find skydiving scarier than kayaking. So it would kind of put the fear of kayaking in perspective for him. But over a decade of kind of this self-torture, he never gave up because he had this vision of this photo right here. And, you know, my entire life, I've always liked to do things that were unusual for women to do or unusual for short people to do. And even kayaking, you know, still all the time, I get people coming up to me at put-ins like, are you sure you can do this river? It's hard rapids down there and you're so little. And it's kind of how do we um, people overcome sort of this lifetime of messaging about what we can and can't do. And I'm still trying to figure that out, but um, I love the idea of, you know, Oprah's quote, figuring out what you want to do. And once you have that idea in your mind, clinging to it with all that you've got. And you're gonna have people giving you negative messaging and you just have to find a way to ignore that or to channel that into some kind of determination to prove them wrong. And then when you do find people that are willing to support you and encourage you, you should spend as much time with them as you possibly can. Because if you work hard enough, if you accept the fact that you're gonna have failures and you can treat those as learning opportunities, to keep moving forward, you can truly accomplish anything that you set your mind to. Thank you all for listening. I hope that the internet was working the whole time and hopefully you all have some questions. That was amazing, Darcy. I am just, um, just so in awe over the whole, the planning, the process, the expedition and you know, and the fact, I think probably my biggest takeaway is, you know, that being able to change your mindset and being able to change your perspective and your outlook on something and, and change your head game. But um, no, your internet was perfect today. So <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that was, that was absolutely phenomenal. And it's, you know, it's a treat to have you back and you know, talk to you again. So right now, what we're going to do is we are going to open up the floor to uh, question and answer. Um, if you have not been to one of these webinars before, the way that we organize this is go ahead and put your questions into the chat. You don't have to write the whole thing out. You can paraphrase it. You can even be like, I have a question about so-and-so, about this, that, and the other thing. And, um, and then I'll go through and, and call on people. But I know that um, our friend Hannah has a question to start off the game with. So Hannah, are you there? We're gonna unmute you and let you ask some questions. Hello. Hello. Okay. So um, my question was, how did writing the book help you analyze the trip? All right, that's an awesome question. Um, it's going to be kind of a long answer, sorry to warn you in advance, but um, it really, writing the book really helped me, um, okay, like I'm a very private and closed off person and I don't like talking about emotions or feeling emotions or any kind of that stuff. And so the original drafts of the book were really quite bad and boring because I didn't have any of this, that element in them. But, you know, all the feedback I got was like, you've got to put some of your personal story into the book. And once I started doing that, like, it was really hard to get started on that because it was so like against my normal MO. But once I started to put my feelings, my thoughts, some of my background in the book, I found it really easy to get going with it. And I really quickly saw like how much better it made the book. So that was kind of a... Uh, extra motivation to keep doing it. Um, and yeah, when I added that kind of extra emotional element, it really helped me, you know, it was easy for me to criticize Midge, for example, because he was really annoying at, at points of the trip. But before I started putting my own part of the story in, I, I didn't realize, you know, how annoying I must have been too. And so it really helped me to be more self-critical 
which in the end helped me take away a lot of lessons from the trip, just like this changing your mindset thing. Um, and it had, changing my mindset has been so helpful in life since the Amazon River, because kind of any situation, you know, I realized that I have a choice, you know, it could be the worst situation in the world and I could just sit there and wallow in my own self pity, or I could try to find whatever good I possibly could in the situation. And doing that, yeah, has just really made me uh, kind of a happier person. It's made me enjoy life, like kind of to the fullest where maybe I wasn't before. And if you, you Han, I know you listen to the flow talk too, that finding enjoyment in everyday situations or in bad situations is a big part of that flow state consciousness too, where you really can try to pull the most enjoyment out of life that you possibly can by using the power of your brain and nothing more. Uh Oh, I think you're muted again, but hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, it was so long winded. Yes, but that's why we have these. So you can answer all of our questions and sit and chat and because it's great because now we can actually sit and talk to each other in person. But for a little bit of, of time, <laughs> we weren't able to do that. So now we we love all your well, we love all your answers. So um, I think Paul has a question for you. So Paul, give me one sec. I'm going to unmute you. All right, there you go. Yeah, it was a great talk. Uh, Darcy, you don't look that short on Zoom. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that terrain, the canyons and stuff, it must have been difficult to scout some of those rapids. And, and how did you do that? And um, the challenges about going blind around corners. So yeah, we... Well, two things about that. So Rocky Contos, the guy that discovered that the Montaro River was longer, he had run the Montaro River, uh, the entire river, one year before our expedition. And he didn't really give us any river beta, but we did talk to him and he, he had told us, you know, you can figure everything out. You know, everything that you need to scout, you can scout. And so it did, it was immensely helpful just having that knowledge that you know, someone else had successfully done this before. And then, um, yeah, it was pretty lucky that the hardest rapids were scoutable. And the, the canyons that were totally bedrock, sheer walled, weren't that hard. And it was okay that we couldn't scout. And we did have our secret weapon along with us, which is Don, who is one of the best boat scouters that I've ever met. And so, <clears throat> you know, we all took turns leading. But truly, whenever it was really complicated or if it was a situation where I really wished that I could scout, then Don was almost always willing to go figure it out. And he's so good at that, that he was able to do it. Did you have any swims on the in that class five? Yeah, we midge swam uh, through, no, twice on the white water. And it just was miraculous um, what, good timing he had in his swims. And one time he got pushed up into like a little pocket in the cliff wall and he couldn't get out of that. And he swam in the pocket, but him and his boat and his paddle all stayed right there. And Don was able to climb down to him and get him and all his pieces out. Mm. And then the other time he swam, he swam out of a pretty big hole and it was a very short gap between his rapid and the next rapid. But, uh, Don and I were able to, I pulled Midge and Don got his boat and we all got to the one eddy between or before the next rapid and got him out. And there's a, there's a whole chapter in the book about a near swim that Midge had that truly if he, he didn't swim, he got out of this hole, fortunately, and he rolled up. But had he swam, I think the entire expedition would have had a, a very different outcome because this was at the top of a, like a two mile series of class five and six whitewater. And I think if he would have swam there, we would not have been able to help him, but he, uh, he got himself out of the hole. So that was good and it made for a happy ending. Uh, one last question, uh, drinking water in the lower Amazon. I, what would you do for that? 
Um, it was actually more complicated in the upper region. So when we got to the lower river, uh, we had a gravity filter and we had UV filters, like a camelback UV filter. And uh, we often bought water too. We were able to buy big jugs of water when we weren't feeling good about the, uh, the water quality. But in the upper regions, the Montaro River to us felt much more polluted, I think just because it had less volume. And we didn't have the gravity filter at that point, but we had our camelback UV filters. And there were a couple instances where I mean, literally the river smelled like poo and we had no choice because there was no villages around or anything but to use our little filters. And there was about three occasions where we all felt fairly confident that we were going to get sick from drinking the water, but the UV filters apparently really worked because we didn't get sick. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Thanks, Paul. Great questions. All right, Gwen. Gwen, you are next. Hey, Darcy. This is, thank you, Melissa. This is amazing, amazing story. So amazing. Well, thank you. Can you talk about what it took to uh, prepare the, the trip, uh, the logistics, like how long it, it took you, uh, what challenges you, you ran into, who was sort of in charge of what? I mean, did you split the work among, among the three of you to handle the logistics and so on? So. Yeah, the logistics um, for a trip this long are definitely kind of mind boggling. Um, at the beginning, Midge did much of the prep work at the beginning, but unfortunately he thought that we were descending the Aparimac River when he did the majority of his logistical work. So he got all the maps of the Aparimac River and he actually went and did some, he rafted some sections of the Aparimac to scope out the whitewater. But then of course we switched plans kind of at the last minute. And um, yeah, so a couple of things we did, Midge uh, funded the entire trip and he bought the kayaks and the sea kayaks and he was in charge of getting the sea kayaks shipped to Peru and then imported into Peru. And that was a, a huge challenge. And he ended up hiring a woman in Lima I don't exactly know how he found her, but she was a TV producer, but she had a lot of connections in the country and he called her the fixer for the trip. And so he would call her up and say, Deborah, you know, the sea kayaks are on a container ship. They're going to be arriving this day. And then she would go deal with them basically. So that, that was really nice to have her for that logistical side of things. And then we ended up having to do quite a lot of logistics once we started the expedition. And that was like a new thing for me and, and a little bit of a bummer, you know, cause we'd kayak all day long and be really tired and be in this amazingly beautiful place. And then instead of just kind of relaxing and eating dinner and go to bed, we'd have to get out the satellite phone, make phone calls, see where was the progress. And one of our biggest things was like how we were gonna get the sea kayaks from Lima to this little tiny town where the flat water began. And there was a lot of debating and going back and forth and then on the road there, there was still some shining path holdouts and some vehicles were getting hijacked. So we were like switching plans kind of at the last minute to try to safely get the, the kayaks there. And then um, once we got to the flat water, we had a variety of different support boats. Um, for the red zone, we had a motorized canoe with a local guy come with us that kind of acted as sort of a liaison between us and the, the indigenous people because we were all speaking Spanish, which was all of our second languages. And so we hired a guy that spoke the local language so that he could help us. And that stuff was all arranged um, on the fly. You know, like it's pretty hard. In, in my experience running a business in Ecuador and then on this Amazon trip, it's pretty hard to arrange stuff very far in advance in South America. That's just like not really the way it operates. So we would get to a village, say like, who's the driver of this motorized canoe? Do you want to make a hundred bucks and come with us for a few days? And that, so it was a lot of on the fly kind of stuff. But yes, it was a constant battle all the way up to the end because we had to change our plane tickets multiple times because we were late finishing. And so it really was like every day some logistical problem had to be tackled. Do you have, uh, no, th that's very interesting. Did you, how did you scout, uh, uh, I, yeah, no, that, I think you, you already addressed it. So no, that, that's oh. good. 
Very interesting, yeah. Well, I guess was Google uh, Earth of any use at any point or? You know, it really wasn't. It's uh, the images, you could kind of see some white blobs in heavy white water areas, but the images were never good enough to give us any real clue was what was there. They were kind of helpful. The Montaro makes like a 180 degree bend and it was kind of helpful there because the canyon was so tight, like you couldn't really see the water anymore. So we knew that that was gonna be a potentially problematic canyon area before we got there, but we never had good enough views to say, oh, that's a big rapid or no, it's flat water in there. Not very useful. Yeah, the biggest, the most useful thing about the white water was just knowing that Rocky Contos had successfully done it the year before. Mm. So. Yeah. Amazing. Awesome. <clears throat> really good questions. Um, we're going to swing this back to the Musgroves. Mark has a question for you. Hello there. Hey, Mark. Hey there. Well, first of all, I say it's a great book. You know, I've, um, I think we read it, I read it in two days flat, which is not normal for me, you know, to actually get into something. So you did a good job. The, the other one I read that was like that was the guy that did two guys that went up a mountain in Peru and the other guy crawled down. He broke his leg. I don't know if you've uh, read that one. Touching the Void by Joe that's, Simpson. That's it, yeah. So that, that's the kind of thing. It's like that to me for, uh, in terms awesome. of Awesome. Well, that's good to hear. Thanks, Mark. Good job. Um, so two questions. One is the obvious one is like, what's your relationship with Midge now after you said you got so more self-aware about it? But, you know, <laughs> It seems an interesting relation. I'm interested in hearing that. And then we've just got off the Rogue and the Smith. And, um, you know, I, the one question I wanted to ask you from the last one was just, what's your secret to packing the boat so you don't end like, like me with the, the bow sort of like pointing upwards and unable to make any forward progress? And what would be your kind of your key pieces of equipment that you take on these, you know, kind of trips that, uh, that you wouldn't leave behind? That's, those are my questions. Okay. So the first one, my relationship with Midge, um, it's always been a little strange. Like I, I would have said that we were friends before the expedition, but I don't know that he would have said that about me because in his mind, it was like very much a client guide relationship. <clears throat> and, you know, he's just not really the kind of guy that talks about friends or friendship or anything like that. And before we went on the expedition, he, he is, totally brilliant computer programmer and definitely his brain functions much differently than my brain functions and he was very analytical about everything like he did tons of research and he learned that groups of three have the highest success or the highest chances of succeeding on a long expedition so that's why he invited three people he had also read that it's like five percent of expedition partners actually stay friends after the expedition so like on day one of the trip midge was like i'm just expecting not to like you guys by the end of this trip and we're like well maybe you should expect to like us and maybe that will make you feel differently he's like nope the statistics say i'm not gonna like you so i'm not gonna like you and so i think our relationship is quite good considering all of that stuff and since the expedition has been seven years now, we trade a handful of emails every year. And I sent him early copies of the book, which he wasn't that thrilled about. And he, he asked me to change a couple things, which I did. And then he, his last comment was, I think you were pretty mean to me and Don, but what can I do, ho-hum? You know, and that was his take on it. And I did say, you know, I'll change it if you want. I can change your name. He's like, no, don't worry about it. And um, since the book has been published, he hasn't made any comment, but we've communicated, you know, he just had another kid, it's his birthday. And so I think our relationship is fine, um, but yeah, not like we're great friends. Although we do all have the plan to get together on the 10 year anniversary to paddle the, oh, I'm gonna say it wrong and you're gonna know, the Thames River from source hey. to sea. Did I say it right? Yep, that's it. That's a good one. Well, my brother lives right there, so we can sort you out when you need to go there. Okay, perfect. Mm. Yeah, it would be, I don't think Midge would be willing to do this, but I would really enjoy, you know, sitting down and talking to him, like in one of these kind of situations, and just hear his side of the story and how much I annoyed him and how he feels about me on the expedition. <laughs> but 
I don't think he's too into that. <laughs> um, and the other question, okay, so packing for an expedition. Um, yeah, so Don and I just got back from Idaho where we did self-support on the Middle Fork and we brought so much stuff, it was kind of ridiculous. And I was like, man, this is like a lot harder than I remember it being. But the biggest thing that, that I have come to enjoy is I have like a long, maybe a two foot long dry bag that's like six inches wide, two feet long, so it's like a big tube. And I've been putting my food, um, the jet boil gas, and whatever else is super heavy in that bag. And then I stick it under my thigh, so like right in front of my seat. And it's like flat enough that it's comfortable. And so that gets like kind of the bulk of my heavy stuff right in front of my seat. Now I said in my expedition talk that I don't like putting stuff in front of my feet on kayaking expeditions. And I'd say that in general, that's still true. But on the middle fork, like we had to bring PVC pipes for the poop tubes and all this kind of bulky stuff that I just couldn't fit in the back. So I did stick stuff in front of my feet and uh, I didn't really notice a big change in performance, but it was kind of extra faff every morning to put it in there. And then, um, yeah, I just try to be super conscientious about like, for example, I put my thermarest in the, in the tail of my boat because that's fairly light and it's something that will fit in the tail. And then my sleeping bag, because I'm vegan and I can't use a down sleeping bag, is really heavy and really bulky. So I stick that right behind my seat. So I just try to really concentrate on everything that's lighter in the tail, everything that's heavier around the seat, including in front of the seat. I like all the heads popping in. <laughs> we're all here. There's like five of us in the back of the truck. We, we're in Willow Creek trying to find LTE in the middle of nowhere. Oh, wow. Good for you guys. Nice work. <laughs> yeah that's interesting because mine was just uh i don't know i have the tent now and the stove and everything for everyone so we just need these guys to have a little bit more in the back of the boat he's very opposed to the jet boil <laughs> you want to cook on the fire i have a special stove it's a very heavy wood burning stove that i like to take ah. <laughs> <laughs> nice so well, really i'm super excited that you guys did self-support on the rogue that's very cool yeah, we had fun. It's great. Okay. Thank you, Darcy. Really yeah. good. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Anna. Yes, it was a it was a really really special stove that I can't wait to use again sometime. Nice. <laughs> All right. So I I had the privilege of being on this trip with them. So that was. That was pretty awesome. But um, and watching Hannah and Maya pack their Remix 47s, which is with as much gear as they could possibly fit into those little teeny tiny boats. So I think you guys did great. That's anyway, awesome. all right. So we're gonna move on to Chelsea. Morgan has a question for you. As soon as we unmute. Come on, technology work. Okay. Sorry, guys, technical difficulties. The little arrow on the little blue button is not wanting to work for me. Hang on. All right, there you go, Chels. Hello, this is Jay. Yay. Um, so I just finished your book and it was very honest and very, it seemed very personal, uh, you know, tell, just really honest about yourself. And so I'm wondering if you have any concerns about like your future clients, like maybe knowing you better than you want them to do too, like on day one, or if you think you'll get, you know, really personal questions that you maybe wouldn't have in the past or, or if that's like already happened potentially. Um, you know, like our clients have always on a certain level just felt free to ask really personal questions, especially ones that have come back year after year. So that might not be too new. Um, in the past, I definitely did not answer their questions. I would evade or just change the subject or whatever. But yeah, it's been kind of an interesting thing, kind of like what I said to Hannah, that um, starting to open up and be honest in the book was incredibly hard. And it took a really long time to like get myself to do it. But 
once I started, it just became easier and easier. And now I've done quite a few podcasts where people ask a lot of personal questions. And I really find that it doesn't bother me anymore. And I don't mind telling my story. And a big part of that is now I've definitely gotten a lot of criticism and, or not a lot, but I've gotten some criticism and that part's not fun, but why it's worthwhile to me is, you know, I have seen a lot of young people and particularly young girls who do kind of listen to this noise of the world when people are telling them they can't, they're too little or girls can't do this stuff. And so whatever kind of flack I get or however uncomfortable I am about sharing my personal story, I really come to feel that it's worth it if it can help people realize that number one, other people go through what they're going through. Number two, like you can fight through it and like stay the course to do what your dream is or what you want to do. And so hopefully that answers your question. I, I am prepared for it. I can't necessarily say that I still love it, but it definitely feels much easier for me. And now that I have a purpose in talking about my personal story, it feels much more worthwhile. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the good question. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, I found on this, this whole series, there's been, I feel like we've gotten to know some people a little bit better. Um, I've been really impressed with all of our presenters stories and some of them have been pretty candid and honest and um it's been i think it's a really great way to make you know especially things like this that you know these grand expeditions or professional paddlers or you know whatever it is that you know folks that kind of exist on this you know where we see what's going on and then you get to know a little bit of more personal pieces of information it makes it a bit more attainable i think to people so yeah. we, we appreciate it and i appreciate it all right, so um, we're going to move on to Heather. Okay. All right, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, awesome. I just bought your book. I'm super excited to read it. Um, I was wondering how you found it, uh, any challenges being a vegan and finding food and stuff like that on the trip? Yeah, it was challenging. Um, I sort of went into this expedition thinking um, if I am like truly starving to death, I have to be mentally prepared to, you know, fall off the vegan wagon, so to speak. <clears throat> but um, so all of us brought 50 days worth of dehydrated meals, like one for breakfast and one for dinner. <clears throat> and um, I, so the boys and I all brought 50. And then I had a whole separate bag that I shipped down there with like, 40 more days of dehydrated meals because I didn't, we all assumed once we got to the flat water that at least they would be able to buy food. And that was true, like fish was everywhere. People would like motor up to us in little canoes and offer to sell them fish. And so it was pretty easy for them. And it, it was reasonable for me, you know, like it wasn't always the most nutritious food. Like sometimes I would just eat rice or pasta or something like that. But regularly enough I could find beans or vegetables or something and I never got so desperate that I considered eating fish or something but I did end up eating those 40 additional days worth of dehydrated meals so yeah it was um it's kind of amazing to me now like when we go on just a couple night overnighter and I eat dehydrated meals how gross they are and how much they upset my stomach and like how did I live for almost 100 days on these nothing but these things <laughs> But yeah, I was able to keep it, keep vegan the whole time. And you know, it is important to me because I do it because I don't like our system of raising animals in the US. And you know, a lot of people are like, well, you weren't in the US, who cares, just do whatever. But it's uh, sort of like part of my moral compass, I guess. So I was happy I was able to stick to it. Well, that's super awesome, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, thanks so much, Heather. Another great question. Um, okay, so at this point, I think unless somebody raises their hand, we are going to wrap up our Q&A session. Three, two, one. All right. Um, so Darcy, if you have any sort of parting words for us, um, we'd love to love to hear them. Yeah, just thanks everyone for coming out. I know your time is valuable and I appreciate you spending it listening to me. Um, yeah, uh, figure out what you wanna do, like Oprah said, 
And once you figure that out, just uh, chase it with all the energy that you possibly have. And um, thanks everyone for your support. I hope you have an awesome summer of kayaking adventures coming up. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for coming. Thank you everyone who has attended these webinars. This has been a heck of a learning curve, I think for all of us. I know for me personally, being in front of the camera, as well as I can speak to a crowd of 500 people, no problem for me to sit in front of a camera and talk to a computer was absolutely and utterly terrifying. And um, <laughs> we've, uh, we've, all, we've all made strides during this whole thing. But um, so we're going to wrap up this first edition series tonight. And then if anybody has missed anything, we, are, we have all of our archives on our e-store. So you can get on the website and check out the shop page. Darcy has two other talks that, are, that were absolutely phenomenal. If you haven't checked them out, get on that shop and, and check out those. We have everything from technique to mental strategies to you know, we had a family series. They're all five bucks. They all go to the, the proceeds all go to support the coaches of these series. And we really appreciate your support. We are all going to take a little bit of break from these webinars for just a little bit and swing into our summer season and hopefully get back to teaching and our trips. And we will pick these, we will pick this series up again, maybe not quite as intensely as, you know, three or four days a week, but we will keep it going there. It, we have so many great topics listed. We have more presenters um, on on deck waiting to talk about some really cool stuff. So please stay tuned, come and see us again. And Darcy, I really, I don't know, I'm just seeing this Cali Collective small world adventure trip on the horizon. So I know we gotta get down to Ecuador soon. So yeah. um, thank you again. Thank you everyone. You're amazing. Stick with it, have fun, be safe. And, um, and we will see you all soon. <laughs>